You've got it locked to New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1, New York. Yay. Yes, it's... Yay. <laughs> standing room only. That's right. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Tonight is Monday, April 13th, 2015. And if you can hear me, then you are listening to Straight Talk with your host, this intellectual Kate Taylor. almost forgot my name there for a second. <laughs> That's because his shirt's and off. I'm telling you. And my co-host, the also shirtless Christopher Crash Jesus Taylor, my mm-hmm. other half, my better half. There you go. Thinks. Yeah. Yes, that's well, right. Okay. Stay with us. We have a heck of a fun show tonight. We've got Jeremy Irvine with us um, promoting his new film, Beyond the Reach. And, you know, we're just going to talk stuff. You know, we're just going to talk stuff. So this Because is, we are New York's number one talk stuff station. That's right. We are. We're the world's best talk radio on the world's first brilliantly exceptional, all utterly original talk entertainment programming ever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Al, are you ready? I am ready. All Only right. one meeps. That's right. And we're going to get to it. we got a lot of fun stuff and a lot of interesting uh, stuff also to get to tonight. And, you know, like, for example, Michael Douglas's role in this film. Yeah. Did you know that it actually promotes his gun control stance? Who would have thunk it? Gun control stance when yeah. he's got that $5 million gun? I know, right? And, you know, I was just uh, informed that, you know, it was his production company that, that picked up this film to make. and uh, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. great, great job. But, uh, yes, yes, so spend some time here with us, and it will become clear to you that we are the only one that can be only one, this one. HTLA Radio 1, New Hi. York. That's right. Visit us at www.htlaradio1.com. Check out all our other stuff. We have lots of stuff. Oh, yeah. We are our... the stuff capital of the world That's here. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And we had a lot of fun today. We did. Well, we did. N- not after any shortage of adventure on the high seas, I might add. That's true. That's true. My God. Well, first we're going to do this here then, and then we're going to do that there I know, then. but press day is tough, you know, and Jeremy had press day, so we try and accommodate our guests as much as possible because we know what it's like, having been in the industry ourselves, and we know what it's like. So we have to kind of accommodate. Oh, well, yeah, know. but that was just nutty. It was nutty, but uh, it was it was good, though. You know, well, it, it was good. You know, it, it, it's 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 always good, uh, especially when, uh, well, you know, you you, you kind of get. Uh, I mean, we get we get celebs all the time, but but to get this guy, yeah, I was so excited too. You know, th- this guy is is I think I really I, I believe the equivalent of. A young Paul Newman. Oh, uh, yeah. A young James Dean. Oh, a, I was so A young impressed. Marlon Brando. I, I swear to God, I've had nothing but a crisis of, like, conscience since our interviews with him. That's because, because you and he talked about him shirtless in his underwear. Well, not only that, but, well, <laughs> you know, you figure that I'm old enough to be his mother, for one. That, so, right? So I have that. Yeah. Like, you know, your mom must be so proud. I, I would be so proud. You know, I have a son, too, and I'd be so proud. You know what I mean? So, so like, for, a... A mama proud, right? But then again, you know, he's he's hot. He's really hot. And, you know, I'm not that old. So, you know, I can still spot a hot guy when I see a hot guy. And, you well, know, You're not that old and I'm not gay, but I'd go there. See, you know what I mean, right? So I've had this, like, divergence of, of conscience here today. Oh, know? sure. He's sure. hot and cute, but yet, you know, I want to be his mommy, too, because he's so perfect for that. Well, I don't want to be his mommy, but I know what you mean. If yes. either of our daughters <laughs> brought him home, I'd be very happy. You know, so oh, sure. it would make a mama proud. Absolutely. Because really, and you'll hear the interview and you'll see what we mean. And I, I was posting after uh, the interview. He's so sweet and he's, he's genuine <laughs> and he's authentic. And, you know, he was you could tell he was raised well and he's got a good family and he's humble and he's not yes. going to be like those, 
you know, flash in the pan teeners. Uh, no, you no, know, absolutely so. not. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's because of where he's from. I think it is. They, they're all, they have a different attitude towards the industry. And we talked about that. Yes, we did. You know, yeah. Europeans, well, especially, you know, the British actors, they're, uh, you know, they take the work more seriously. You know. Absolutely. And uh, that that really comes through in, in, in some of the questions that we asked. Some of them, uh, the folks over at uh, jeremy-irvine.org, uh, right. some of those fans provided us with some direct questions Which as well. Which we did ask for you. Yes, we did. But yes, we have those uh, completely answered here for you on the show. So, um, But, but you, you get that sense. Uh, he, he's, he's not like the majority out there it, it, that have those kind of sort of default answers, I guess, for lack of a better word. Oh, sure, yeah. He was having a lot of fun with this, too, because, you know, if you've listened to any of my celebrity interviews before, I love to throw questions at them that they don't hear. Oh, sure, yeah. So, and he was like, oh, I never got that one before, and oh, where did that one come from? And, you know, you have to make them think a little bit. (laughs) Well, and and indeed we did. In fact, we've asked him some questions that he even said nobody has asked him before. Right. You know, I don't care who you're wearing, and I don't care, you know, what your other things are. I want to know about you when you you come on and... Sure, we'll talk about your project, but, you know, <laughs> that's just part of the job. <laughs> you know? I, I don't think in your mind he was wearing anything and during that interview. Uh. <laughs> well, listen, we've got some station business to get to before we get to everything else on the old hit parade tonight. Yes, so, uh, we did. Well, what, what are we going to roll out there? Well, first of all, let's say that uh, feel free if you want to call in and, and speak with us. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we'll, we'll try to get to some questions like that in the uh, second segment after we get his interview out there. But you can call us, 914-873-1NYC. That's HTLA's official phone number. And for you uh, letter dysfunctional folks out there, that's 1692. Right, (laughs) 873-1692. And I always remember it because, you know, Columbus was 1492, so 1692. Right, it's just a difference of 200 years. (laughs) That's it, right. (laughs) (laughs) Something so small. Yes. Exactly. There we go. So, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, well, t- tonight, Straight Talk is, of course, brought to you by Tim Hortons, New York City. Now, with eight fine locations in the city to serve all your coffee and baked goods needs. Oh, we forgot to ask him if he drinks Timmy's while he's in New York. Uh, Tim Hortons, always fresh. Also by Netflix Original Productions. Yes, making a Netflix night. And PreSonus, HCLA Studio 2 in Manhattan is, of course, a PreSonus broadcast studio. Couldn't do it without you. That's right. <laughs> and also Fierce Kitty Omnimedia. Yeah. Soon to come out with a line of shirtless shirts for, <laughs> for yeah, Jeremy. I'm going to call Irvine. Jeremy back and say, let's do a line. That's yeah, right. That is. That's our, our girls are empowered. You know, feminine is, is awesome. That's my my message with that whole thing. Yes. I um, don't know what you just said. There you go. Well, see, that's because you're a boy. There you go. Okay. <laughs> now, for Twitter, follow us at uh, HTLA Radio 1. That yeah. is our station. And uh, Crash at Crash Talking, that's for hubby over here. Yes, and that's HTLA Radio and then the number one. Right, just like us. There you exactly. go. And for me, mm-hmm. it used to be at Fierce Kitty Kate. You can still follow that, but it's now HTLA Kate Taylor at HTLA Kate Taylor. There you go. And they finally, locked me out of my other one. <laughs> yes, because you're just such the, uh, yes. They didn't believe it was me. <laughs> well, finally, remember, you can uh, <clears throat> join us here every week because you never know who's going to show up on Straight Talk to talk straight. That's right. Now, before we roll, it is time, of course, to say it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You ready? I am. Tonight's show is... Powered by Procast. Oh, yeah. yeah. There you go. All right. Yes. Yes, we don't use the electric grid here. We're, we're powered by Procast. That's right. There and that, it's coming. It is. It is. It, it, <laughs> We've it, been saying it for a while now, but it is. It better be. Just like everything else in this industry, it takes years. Very true. Very <laughs> so true. It is coming. Yeah. No. Well, speaking of years, mm-hmm. and I didn't bring this up with Jeremy because I wasn't sure if he knew, you know, being being a youngin and all that. But uh, this is originally a, a book called Death Watch. This this film was adapted from a book. Um, oh, gosh. Yes. Rob White, was it? Who yes. Was it? Right? Yes. Uh, anyway, he was born in like 1909. He died in, uh, oh, long while, 1990, I think. 
Uh, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, he was 83, so you add the years. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was originally a book, and it was made as a movie of the week, starting to get this, Andy Griffiths and Sam Bottoms in 1974. Really? Yes. So it was uh, actually titled Savages, that movie of the week. Right. 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 So Jeremy had said that, you know, Michael's uh, production company – had had the story and thought it would make a really good story and that you know so i'm not sure if he knows that it was already a movie of the week starring at the time two of the biggest actors then yes you right. know yep. and uh, they made it for tv and it was probably just as exciting and that's another thing i mean obviously mr douglas can spot a good story and you know like i always say writing wise you know it's got to transcend the ages sure and um you know to be as poignant as it was when it was written as a book and then you know, in 74 when it was made and now today still to be so brilliant because the story is. Absolutely. You well, know. if you're not familiar with the story or you haven't seen the trailers yet, we're, of course, talking about uh, Michael Douglas and Jeremy Irvine starring in Beyond the Reach. What began as an accident has become a deadly game, which is kind of the way I feel about our radio show here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say our marriage. You are so lucky. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's fine. I'm I'm Okay. Uh, one of these days we'll interview, you know, some crazy, sexy, you know, woman celeb. and Sure we you know, will. <laughs> we'll talk to her about uh, being uh, just in our underwear. That's fine. Yes. Uh, a high-rolling corporate shark and his impoverished young guide, of course, play the dangerous game during a hunting trip in the Mojave Desert. Right. Now, these guys, these, these crazy guys, went out to, uh, well, a, a crazy place. In New Mexico. Several in, locations in New Mexico, in New Mexico to Mexico, right? uh, to film this, and of course they 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 were actually in 130 degree heat doing yes, this. Yes, right. That, that just staggers me. You know, for for the folks out there saying, "Oh, well, these actors they get paid too bloody much money." Well, yeah, I don't think so. Oh, yeah, stay on a set for 18 hours and then come talk to us, and don't have a trailer like the actors do. Uh, 18 hours <laughs> for three months. Well, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, don't forget that. Well, I'm sure Mr. Douglas had a great, nice air conditioned trailer. Jeremy probably as well. I'm sure Ronnie Cox is in this too, and I'm a huge fan of Ronnie Cox. And, you know, I don't know if Jeremy had any scenes with him because I haven't seen the screener. We actually were invited to the screener in New York, but we couldn't get there. The weather was so bad in February, we couldn't mm. get there. But, um, yeah, I love him. He's, you know, ever since oh, yeah. Robocop, I'm a huge Ronnie <laughs> Cox fan. Right. Yeah. But. Well, yeah. yeah. So, like I was saying, you know, if, even if you don't have the luxury of the trailer like the stars do, mm -hmm. you know, people that say that obviously have never spent any kind of time working well, you, on a you know, movie and, set because it's and, the and, most grueling and, thing. And, you know, regardless of what you say about the stars, you know, the bottom line is they still have to get out of the trailer and go to the movie. They do. And Jeremy was talking about having all the uh, prosthetics on because thankfully he wasn't as red sunburned as the film makes him appear. Right. <laughs> Poor baby. He was a lobster. Every time I saw those <laughs> scenes, I cringed, you know. Oh, remember, folks, she said, Poor baby. I did. Wow. <laughs> See? Look at that. I feel like just so much plus. <laughs> but like I said, don't, I'm looking at him like I would our son or, you know, any one of our other children. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm quite sure. Right. You know, when you talk about somebody's mom, you know, you can't really have those kind of feelings towards them anymore. It's kind of weird. So. Oh, I don't know. You're... I'm not the cougary type. You know, I don't like younger men anyway. <laughs> Here we go. So there you go. I don't. I've always liked older men. <clears throat> you know. Uh, yes. I like my intellectual and uh, maturity equal. What? You're saying Jeremy's not that? Well, well. Oh, nailed. There all right. Go. Well, just by virtue of, of the age difference and the life experience, et cetera, you know, so. Well, it, yeah. No, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Although he doesn't have much growth. <clears throat> I mean, I've seen a lot of, of twice as old men as he does that, you know, has a heck of a lot more growth to do than this kid has. So. Oh, sure. Yeah. But I chalk it up again to, honestly, good good raising, good parental raising. You know, he comes from good stock. He's got good parents, good careers, solid careers. He's got two younger brothers, mm -hmm. one who's also an actor, Toby Irvine. Um, right. And, uh, you know, his mom's a hoot. He takes her to premieres and events and stuff like that. And one of the uh, – when they were doing Great Expectations, the – I don't know if it was the director or someone, the producer, came up to him and said, wow, if only I had a younger version of him, you know. He said – she said, well, I have one at home, you know, and that's how Toby Irvine got the uh, role <laughs> as the younger Pip, right? There you go. So, you know, 
it's just good. And she's uh, actually works for the government over there, the local. I don't know what they call the localish government there, but uh, uh, the British government, I believe. No, well, <laughs> you know, like we have provincial and municipal and things like that. You know, so I don't know how it's divvied up there. Actually, uh, no, we have state. Well, we do. <laughs> Oh, hush. I mean in North America. Oh, anyway. right. Well, there you go. Right. So we had talked a little bit about that, you know, that uh, the admiration for him, his mother, you know, she actually rehomes ha- homeless people and, you know, that he feels like his job is just so much fun and, you know, she actually does the real work and yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. So you know that the kid's raised with some good stock and some good, you know, I look at the kids in this country today and. Absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah, that's the other thing too that you can you can tell from the interview. Which, yes, yes, relax. We'll get to in a yes, few minutes. Yes, we will get to. <laughs> but um, you know, we, we, come on, this, we, we got to you know keep you waiting here, right? Um, <laughs> you, you you can even tell. You know, like I said a little bit earlier in in his responses, uh, you know, he, he's he, he's got some substance to him. You know, right. he's, he's not just one of these. <laughs> Yeah. You know, Hunger I mean, Games. <laughs> uh, well, he turned down the lead in Hunger Games mm-hmm. as well as Divergent. So there you go. He didn't want to be that teeny flash in the pan kind of star. I don't know how I feel about that, you know, because uh, I, I can see his point. Sure. You, you might, you know, forever be shelved away as Gandalf or you might forever be Ask shelved Robert away. Ask Robert Pattinson. <sighs> Well, Twilight yeah, didn't but, exactly help his career. Well, I, I think that's just because of who he is. Because of this kid here, you know, the start of the show when I said that I, I, I thought that he was, you know, a young Paul Newman or a, a young Marlon Brando kind of thing. I think this guy has got the dimension and the depth right. uh, in order to make this a lifelong career, uh, you know, not just the teeny bopper films. Right. And as a director yourself, you can spot that kind of thing. Yeah. You know. Knowing yeah. who you want to work with and who you don't. And as a writer, I know that, you know, I can already envision, you know, parts that have that kind of depth that I would love to write in that way. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And, and though- it's funny that you say that because uh, Jeremy has a, an, an affinity for war movies. He's done a, a film that was set in the First World War. He's done a film that was set in the Second World War. And... um you know, he's been asked before, and uh, he has an interest in history, which he actually says in this interview with us. Right. And uh, but but he 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 likes the war films. He likes those kind of periods, those kind of feelings, those kind of feels. Right. And he uh, you know is is quite obviously destined to do more. And 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 I could totally see him. And and, and this is really strange because. Uh, you know the way he talks. You know he's got that British accent, but every movie he doesn't. <laughs> every movie he doesn't. And, he's so believable, and, and, and he a does yank. extremely well. Yeah, with with the uh, you know the accents and whatnot for whatever part he's playing. I would also, or almost, I should say, you know, I've got that that script pure playground about that Vietnam vet. Oh right. In another five or six years, he could do that. Well, he wouldn't be that old in five or six years, though. Little longer, but oh god, here she goes. We'll, we'll keep it. We'll keep it going. Now I have some rewrites to do, but that's a great premise too. But we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. You know what? The topic might be a little too sensitive now for the day and age in this country, too. So, but anyway, that's a great mystery. We'll, we'll talk about that on another show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but I see where you're going with that. That is a purely psychological. Um, there are no props. It's just him. In that film, it's just him. Yeah. So um, that would be a nice, challenging role that I am sure, you know, listening to him talk, he would actually appreciate. Well, it's a character piece. Right. And exactly. character pieces appeal. So, right. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. Well, we'll let you, uh, you know, we got to flesh that out more a bit. Yeah. yeah. Flush it out. Send it to the agent. There we That's go. That's it. There you go. That's it. <laughs> well, listen, we're going to go for our first commercial break, but don't go anywhere because when we come back, right, we're going to lay it all on you. Mm-hmm. Yes, we, we nailed him down. We got him. And he's up next, so don't go anywhere. Back in two minutes. And you're listening to Straight Talk with Kate and Crash on HTLA Radio 1, New York. What if there was a coffee that was sourced from some of the world's most renowned growing regions, abundant with rich, fertile soil? 
What if this coffee was picked at the perfect moment, then packed meticulously and shipped carefully to be roasted under the watchful eye of coffee masters? What if it was expertly blended, ground, and sealed, ensuring maximum flavor and freshness? Then brewed in small batches and always served fresh within 20 minutes, just the way you like it. Now, what if this coffee just happened to be the coffee you already know and love? Tim Hortons, always fresh, always great tasting coffee. Some said the U.S. has lost its innovative power. We said America is lighting the way as the innovation nation. Singular insights, superior execution. That's the power of global connections. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Voted top global research firm, 2011, 12, and 13. Wait a sec. I found our colors. We've made the decision. Great. Let's look at your setup. We need the brush. You should check out our workshop. Push your color boundaries while staying well within your budget walls. I want to paint something else. More saving, more doing. That's the power of the Home Depot. Bare Premium Plus Interior Paint. Only at the Home Depot and now only $23.46 a gallon. I've been so inspired by being in New York because everything from what people are wearing on the street to the way they're interacting with each other to drive through the West Village at, at night and you see a couple kissing on the street or you see someone fighting outside their apartment or you see so much humanity on a daily basis that even if you're not inspired by your own life that day, you can be inspired by someone else's life. You got that long hair sleep. There's only one place to get more Taylor. Once again, every sip of your favorite coffee gets you closer to spectacular prizes. With the return of Roll Up the Ring the Wind. Like one of a thousand Napoleon Gourmet Grills. One of a hundred five thousand dollar MasterCard prepaid cards. One of millions of coffee and food prizes. Or one of 40 Toyota RAV4s. It's the coffee you love and the cup you love to roll. You've got it locked to New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1, New York. Well, welcome back, ladies and joins. Special uh-huh. edition Straight Talk tonight, on Monday, 13th of April, 2015. Believe it or not, it's still 62 degrees in Central Park right now. Yeah, so that moon and some clouds, it's only supposed to get down to 56. That's not too bad. Uh, Tonight's episode of Straight Talk, of course, is brought to you by Tim Hortons, New York City. Now with eight fine locations in the city to serve all your coffee and baked goods needs. Check them out. Tim Hortons, always fresh. Yes. And tonight's episode is Beyond the Reach, a new Michael Douglas, Jeremy Irvine film. From those fine folks at Roadside Attractions bringing it to you this Friday in theaters, April 17th. Yeah, you're going to want to see this one. Uh huh, definitely. Yes, absolutely. Hey, no, 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 no. It's just more <laughs> about that, uh, you know, how Mr. Douglas is, uh, always uses his films, you know, to subliminally kind of get the messages that he is, you know, heartily involved in across. So kind of interested about that, too, because, of course, uh, you know, he's um, he's advocating no gun rights. Well, no, actually, he's always been a proponent of gun control. 
Oh. You know, and when he did China Syndrome, you know, it was a monster movie to him because it was a nuclear power plant that was out of control. That was the, the monster. You know, he loves doing these kind of thrillers that have a message because, you know, unless the thriller part works, he says, you can't hit your audience over the head with your message. You know, you have to kind of subliminally deliver it, and that can only happen if the thriller part of the film works. So as a writer and a screenwriter, that is appealing to me to to kind of figure out the underlying you know, kind of Things. thing about that. Right? Yes, exactly. yes. Well, interesting way that he does it in this film because, of course, he's got, well, pretty much the nicest sniper rifle I have ever seen. <laughs> the, the the American sniper and Clint Eastwood would both be salivating over this thing. It's it's just amazing. I want the Mercedes in this film. Well, I knew Supposedly, you would. they say in the film, it's the only one in existence. <laughs> and, and I want it. So, yes. Oh. I do. Okay. Right. There you go. Well, the owner of the Mercedes in Beyond the Reach, feel free to call. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, well, I'm uh, getting one for Mother's Day. Might as well be that one. Oh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think we'd have it any other way. In fact, uh, I'll uh, I'll just rip up that check I gave Gia for that $5.4 million of Kanye water today oh, on eBay. Oh, my goodness. That story was crazy. And uh, we'll just give it to you so you can go get the Mercedes. There you go. Right. They'll take it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, let's not keep them waiting any longer. Okay. Let's roll that Jeremy Irvine interview we did today, and uh, we'll let you hear from him himself. Well, there you go. Here he is. Hi there. Hi, how are you? This is Kate Taylor. I'm with I'm my ki- producer, Chris Taylor, here in HDLA Studio 2. Cool, cool. No worries. So how, are you, how are you doing? You're on your way doing lots of press today for the film, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just in the in the car at the moment. Cool. Yeah. Well, we've got a few questions for you, and um, we've actually been, you All know, right. talking with your fan sites. You know, a few of your bigger fan sites, and we've got some questions from some of your fans on there as well, if you don't mind. Oh wow! Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. All right. So. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the film. I know you have some questions, Chris. Well, yeah, we're we're basically here with uh, Jeremy tonight to uh, talk about uh, Roadside Attractions' release uh, for Beyond the Reach, the Michael Douglas film mm-hmm. uh, that uh, Jeremy is is starring in with him, and uh, that uh, I believe the the release date for us is uh, April seventeenth. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, this Friday. Yeah. Right. Um, so just a, a little bit to, to get into things here. Uh, give us your, your take on the film. You know, we, we, we know the body of work, and, and certainly all your fans know the body of work that uh, you've done thus far. Uh, where, whereabouts on the scale would you put this film, Jeremy? <laughs> well, this was a, uh, I mean, I, is, I guess it's quite, a, it's quite an odd sort of thriller, this movie. It's... Um, it's you know Michael Douglas's uh, production company that did it. It was a story that he found and thought would make a great film. And it's uh, I guess it's yeah it's got this kind of old fashioned cat and mouse uh, quality to it, but right. um, also quite tongue in cheek as well. It kind of uh, I guess uh, yeah it has a few laughs at itself along the way. And it's um, basically I play a, a desert uh, guide. And I uh, take Michael Douglas's character on a hunting trip, mm-hmm. uh, and then something goes horribly wrong. There's a terrible accident, and I want to go to the police, and he doesn't. But out in the desert, without shade and water, you can you can die in a matter of hours. So he strips you of my clothes and all my equipment, and basically uh, watches me stumble around the desert until I die of dehydration. Right. And uh, without giving too much away, I go and have my own back. <laughs> Well, yeah, absolutely, and of course we've we've seen the trailers out from Roadside, and uh, this is really uh, a foray into an action film for you, isn't it? Um, yeah, I guess it is. I guess it is, and you know, I've always really enjoyed that sort of stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. it's uh, the action, you know, coming from uh, more kind of of the theatre side of things earlier on in my career. It's like the action stuff you don't really get to do with that. So, uh, right. yeah, it's a nice excuse to yeah you know, use film to. Uh, you know, run around and jump over stuff and have big explosions and right. all that kind of fun stuff. Well, you're certainly no stranger to that. I mean, having done War Horse first and, uh, you know, some of your other films that you're now known for, you know, being so gritty and, and kind of really getting into that method acting kind of thing. I, I read so much about you and I read that you decided early on that you didn't really want to be famous, you know, and now that fame has kind of found you. 
you know, you kind of can't get away from it now, oh. even if you tried. Well, I no, 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 it's it's a funny one that I wouldn't say I'm trying to get away from things like that because it's you know it's, it's a byproduct of getting to do the job the job that I love. But right. I, I have noticed you know in my very small amount of experience in this industry and the people who are the happiest seem to be the ones that are. Um, or the, the famous people who, who are happiest are the ones that really love their job. And you know, Michael Douglas is a, is a prime example of that. He's, he's like a little kid on set, and he you know, just loves loves making movies. Um, and the ones who, to me, it's a bit quite unhappy are the ones who maybe chased it for the wrong reasons. And uh, you know, the whole fame side of things ultimately is going to be it's going to be very disappointing. I think to anyone who, who chases that, it's uh, it's not quite as glamorous as it seems. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Well, we do well now. So, you know, and that's so great to hear you that coming from, you know, just kind of really getting into the meat of this industry that you can stay so grounded. Mm. So I guess it's your family that oh, keeps well, you that so. way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. But um, oh, thank you. what was harder? You know, what was the hardest film that you've done so far? You know, because I know you've done a lot of these um, gritty types now. So I mean, this one, this one Beyond the Reach is, uh, I mean, it's, it's up there. I mean, uh, this is definitely physically. Uh, one of the most demanding. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you see in the in the movie, well, you know, I'm running across the desert naked and well, almost naked. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, no shoes on. A lot of that stuff, you know, is real. You can't really fake that. And uh, also, I had a huge, I get terribly sunburned in this. I had a huge I makeup job for about I three felt, and a half hours. I felt so bad for three you just hours seeing that. <laughs> well, you, well, you know, the, yeah, but, um, the, 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 the okay. Work. The word on the street is that, uh, of course, the, the the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences uh, is going to be creating a brand new award, which is the Best Naked Man, and and I think they do. You're up for that one this year. <laughs> yeah, definitely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, it's, I don't know. It's funny because just before this, I'd done I'd done a movie called The Railway Man, which I think is is out there with the hardest one um, I've done. And uh, I'd have to lose about 35 pounds worth of, of weight. So I was incredibly skinny. Yeah, we heard that. And then that. about six weeks before starting starting this job, the uh, the director phones me up and is sort of saying, Jeremy, we, we must have the abs. You know, <laughs> <laughs> half naked through most of the movie. So, uh, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, I had to do six weeks of pretty intense gym work to, uh, to get myself in shape. Yeah. Well, you did a great job, I must say. Speaking <laughs> for the, the girl, the girl population. Yes, I think you did a great job. So, we have I teenage well, daughters. So. Point, in real life, I don't look like that. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know. See, they don't know. We know. But uh, so right. we've got some fan questions. Well, I already asked one, but uh, what would your dream role be? Dream role. Um, wow. I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's funny. I don't go looking for anything specific in roles and scripts. You know, it's funny. You just when sometimes you just read something and it, and it just stays with you for a couple of weeks afterwards. You know, you're, you're just always thinking about it. And uh, I can't really put a finger on that. But um, I don't know. I did a. Uh, I saw a play when I was sixteen, which was a Royal Shakespeare Company production of The Seagull, and uh, that was one of the things that kind of cemented it for me. Uh, wanting to be an actor, so I guess. Uh, yeah, I'd like to go back to the stage at some point and uh, I don't know, maybe have a crack at that. Right. That sounds great. Well, that would be welcome too, definitely. you got to stick to the straight drama, I think, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What have you got? You got any? Well, I, I do have a, a couple, of course. Uh, I know you do. From uh, jeremyirvine.org, one of the, the main fan sites there. <laughs> That's right. Uh -huh. <laughs> Websites named after you Brilliant. and everything. Uh, basically, uh, what some of the, the, the folks are wanting to know, Jeremy, is... Uh, do you have a childhood hero, and and if so, who is that? I have a childhood hero. Um, that's all. I've never been asked that. I mean, got so many interviews. I don't think anyone's asked that before. Um, I don't know. You see, I mean, I was always, um, I guess, I was always kind of uh, fascinated by. I mean, at one point, I was heavily into sports. I would do sports too, but I mean, uh, there's actors that I always, um, you know, hugely admired growing up. Um, I guess like people's careers, like Christian Bale's career and right. and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's careers, and you know just those wonderful kind of choices. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they were heroes growing up. It was uh, I don't know. I was just a bit too focused on that, doing my own thing, I guess. Right. I remember reading something that you said. Uh, you know, the real to you, the real people, the important jobs. Your friend who's a doctor, and your mom who you know rehouses homeless mm. people. Those sort of things. So as a mother, you know, we like to hear those things. You know, so <laughs> well, for sure. I mean, you know, in terms of in terms of the people I always looked up to, I guess you know, my mom and dad were kind of were kind of that. Um, and you know, I, it's funny. I mean, being in the industry now, I find it so weird 
you know, when uh, War Horse was nominated for all these things like Oscars and Golden Globes, and I went to all the uh, went to all the the big kind of fancy ceremonies and things. And uh, you know, the first thing that really struck me is, wow, you know, just for for acting, I'm getting all this, you know, all these fancy ceremonies, and my mum rehouses homeless people for a living, and she doesn't get things like that. Right. Um, so you know, that's, so it's kind of yeah, hard to adjust to at first, I guess. Oh, it's it's great for us to hear. This is really a socially kind of based show that we do regarding entertainment and stuff. So, you know, to hear that yeah. kind of thing. If there is something that you would be involved in socially, you know, that you would use your fame for, what would it be? Um, you know, I mean, it's it's. I mean, that is one of the very privileged sides of it. You know, that you are able to, uh, you know, in some respects, um, bring awareness to things. And right. um, in my spare time, I like to I like to write um, kind of factual. Um, on the facial kind of side of things, and looking to do some documentaries next year that, um, uh, for a couple of charities and things. And uh, you know, they're not. They're, I'm sure the TV production companies that we're talking to wouldn't be interested if you know if I hadn't been in films. So I guess that's a that's a that's a pro, definitely. Yeah. Right. Well, it's good. Yeah. yeah. We, I think that you definitely have to sort of do that. Oh, and I don't think with you we have to worry about it. I think that you'll definitely be someone that in the future would do that, and that makes us so happy because. You know, we always strive to to give back and stuff like that. So, you know. yeah, well, it's a, you know, it's a very like I said, it's a very privileged position to be in. And, uh, you know, if you can, yeah, right. bring awareness to things, then uh, I don't see what possible harm could come from that. No, yeah. absolutely. So, so with these uh, documentaries, uh, you, you're you're looking to work behind the camera. Um, well, kind of. I mean, you know, the, the idea would be to uh, a couple that I've written. That, um, the idea would be obviously presenting them. Is, okay. Me presenting is how I get these get these things made. But um, yeah, there's a there's a bit of a there's a history one and a couple of other things. But um, yeah, yeah, you're a history I can buff. Talk about aren't those you? more when we've uh, when we got them uh, got them going and stuff. Right. I remember reading your history buff. I was there, buff, but um, no, it's something I'm interested in. Yeah, definitely. So um, it must have been really appealing. Yeah, it's funny because I was never. Yeah. Well, it's like. I was, uh, my school made me stop history before my uh, before my exams at school um, because I was so bad at it. So oh. uh, <laughs> I guess maybe it came from that. A bit of a, <laughs> oh my a, bit of a, a middle finger to that, I suppose. <laughs> uh, we have another uh, fan question. You said that you did like sports when you were younger. So we have a question about if, you know, you liked football, who's your favorite team? Favorite team? Um, I yeah, I mean it's always I guess it's always been Manchester United, but um, I've kind of uh, I'm more of a, I'm more into rugby and uh, I love Formula One racing as well. Big fan of that. I got to go and uh, got to go and watch it in Montreal this year, which was amazing. Cool. Yeah, those cars are pretty awesome. Oh, it's amazing, <laughs> and it's such like it's, I think it's one of the last sort of truly glamorous sports as well. I mean, it's just I don't know, the behind the scenes of that world is just incredible. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, now uh, yeah. the, the the film Beyond the Reach here that now that shot in places like Aztec and Farmington, New Mexico, correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, right. we, well I mean, we were based out of Farmington. But really, we were driving hours and hours into the desert, yeah. into the middle of nowhere, because we had to have it completely free of any kind of human um, human scarring on the landscape. Right. So, uh, yeah, we were it, really in the sticks, as you say. Right. So, uh, for for uh, just you know, when you were out shooting, then uh, you know you were out there yeah. in those hundred and thirty degree temperatures. How did you? Uh, how did you yeah, deal with that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was. Uh, I mean, it was tough. And I mean, the hardest thing actually about it was the was the amount of prosthetic makeup that, that I had on. Um, uh, we had sort of three and a half hours uh, makeup job in the morning, and uh, anyone who's who's worn prosthetics tell you how uncomfortable it is. Especially if you're sweating underneath it and stuff, and you have, um, you know, like, uh, uh, yeah, sort of. I mean, it feels like uh, it's really like anything to describe it to. Is like it feels like having huge condoms sort of stuck all over your body. <laughs> <laughs> it's really that can't huge, be pleasant. Very no. itchy and uncomfortable. And stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, one more briefly. I know that you have to go. Uh, we heard this is your first on-screen sex scene. Was this film? Is that true? Yeah, yeah, that's, that is true. Han, yes, I can. Hannah Lawrence was oh. your uh, counterpart, and you got some advice from Mr. Douglas about that. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of, you know, Michael was so, so approachable throughout the whole process. So um, that was really great. Like, I thought, well, who, who better to, to talk to about many sex scenes than, uh, than Michael Douglas? That's you know, right. He's kind of, the king every of them. Great, yeah. Every great sex scene in cinema is kind of... Uh, it's kind of one of his. So, uh, right. yeah, I just knocked on his trailer door and uh, said, you know, what, <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, he was really cool. He kind of said that I had to um, 
I just go and talk to the actress, tell her what I wanted to do and uh, see what she was comfortable with. And in the end, I kind of went up to her and was you know, all nervous and blabbering like an idiot. And uh, she was so cool and just kind of said, everything's good. And then kind of just grabbed me and led the way, so to speak. Ah, that's good. <laughs> Kind of reverse yeah. Fifty Shades of Grey there, yeah. <laughs> That's it, yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, so what's uh, what's coming up next for you now, Jeremy? What's going on? Uh, so next we got, um, I think the next movie out will be a movie called Fallen, which is a big uh, teen uh, kind of franchise movie, I guess. Um, I mean, we'll see how that goes, but it's uh, it's cool. I mean, you know, I've always been nervous about those sort of films, but um, this one I read the script, fell in love with it. But it was just a beautiful love story. And then subsequently found out that it was based on a, a best-selling uh, load of books. Right. So, um, yeah, so I'm very excited for that one. And the other one is a movie called Stonewall, which uh, Roland Emmerich's directed, um, which is all about the gay rights riots in New York in 1969. Oh. And um, that's, uh, I don't know, every now and again you, know, you do a movie that feels like it's more than just a film. Right. And that one certainly had that, had that feeling about it. And you know, it's a hugely important story that I think a lot of people outside of the gay community don't know about. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's one. Um, yeah, I feel very passionately about. Well, that that sounds great. Did you cool. uh, did you have anything more? Cool. Jeremy? No, and you know, just thank you so much for stopping by. I know that you've been so busy, and hopefully, you'll come by with your future oh, it's films. A pleasure. Thank you for having me. You're very thank welcome. You. Great luck with the All film, right. Jeremy. Hey, Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Well, there he is. There he was. That was so fun. I know. It's always terrible when they're in a hurry and you don't get as much time. But I thought we we did well with that one. Absolutely. And I'm really looking forward to him coming back for his other films. So we'll make sure to get more time with him now. Now we can say to him, hey, more time. Hey, yeah, right here. (laughs) That's it. There's only one. (laughs) That's it. This one. That's right. Right. So we're going to go for our second commercial break. But don't you worry. When we come back, we've got a whole bunch more on Jeremy and... Beyond the Reach with Michael Douglas. We'll be back in two. You've got it locked to New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1, New York. What if there was a coffee that was sourced from some of the world's most renowned growing regions? Abundant with rich, fertile soil. What if this coffee was picked at the perfect moment, then packed meticulously and shipped carefully to be roasted under the watchful eye of coffee masters? What if it was expertly blended, ground, and sealed, ensuring maximum flavor and freshness, then brewed in small batches and always served fresh within 20 minutes just the way you like it? Now, what if this coffee just happened to be the coffee you already know and love? Tim Hortons. Always fresh. Always great tasting coffee. Wait a sec. I found our colors. We've made a decision. Great. Let's look at your setup. We need the brush. You should check out our workshop. Push your color boundaries while staying well within your budget walls. I want to paint something else. More saving, more doing. That's the power of the Home Depot. Bare Premium Plus Interior Paint. Only at the Home Depot and now only $23.46 a gallon. I've been so inspired by being in New York because... Everything from what people are wearing on the street to the way they're interacting with each other to drive through the West Village at at night and you see a couple kissing on the street or you see someone fighting outside their apartment or you see so much humanity on a daily basis that even if you're not inspired by your own life that day, you can be inspired by someone else's life. You got that long hair slick. There's only one place to get more Taylor. 
Some said the U.S. has lost its innovative power. We said America is lighting the way as the innovation nation. Singular insights, superior execution. That's the power of global connections. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Voted top global research firm, 2011, 12, and 13. Once again, every sip of your favorite coffee gets you closer to spectacular prizes. With the return of Roll Up the Ring the Wind. Like one of a thousand Napoleon Gourmet Grills. One of a hundred five thousand dollar MasterCard prepaid cards. One of millions of coffee and food prizes. Or one of 40 Toyota RAV4s. It's the coffee you love and the cup you love to roll. And you're listening to Straight Talk with Kate and Crash on HTLA Radio 1, New York. Oh, you know you are. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. If it's Monday, then of course you are. That's right. And we are back. And, of course, you are listening to HTLA Radio 1, New York, New York's best talk. And this is Straight Talk uh, for your Monday, the 13th of April, 2015. Currently 62 degrees in Central Park right now under partially cloudy skies, but who cares? It's 62. It is. Yeah. I think spring is finally, finally sprung. <laughs> finally. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, we're here tonight, of course, uh, with Jeremy Irvine for Beyond the Reach, the new Michael Douglas film from uh, Roadside Attractions and Lions Gate. And, uh, yeah, we were going to, uh, we, we, we just actually had the segment uh, of the actual interview today. Uh, things went nuts. We were going to have them live in the studio, then we were going to have them uh, live at a conference room, then we were going to have them live here or live there. It was, it was, it was nutty. And then we, we finally, was. of course, nailed them down to a cell phone and a car. We even had to push your <laughs> show back today. That's oh, right. we did all kind of, we moved heaven and we earth. We did. We did. We, we really did, and, uh, well, of course, uh, everything finally, finally worked out. We we got the interview right. done. We we got the, the show doing now, although... Well, We're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, thank goodness <laughs> the new Mommy's Helper started this week, or else I would have had to go home. <laughs> but, well, that's true, too. Yes, and then it'd just be me. That's right. It would be straight talk with Crash. Yeah. Yes. And that just doesn't work. No. No. And any of my longtime fans and listeners know that this used to be straight talk with Kate Taylor. Yes, when we first got married and started HTLA Radio 1, it was Straight Talk with Kate Taylor. Oh, yes, back in the day before Jeremy Irvine took off his shirt. That's right. But, you know, <laughs> when you're married, everything eventually becomes one and melds, and including shows. <laughs> so Yeah, well. Well, coffee and cigarettes is all yours. And home talk, although you have your little crash corner, it's all mine. Well, you just so. you just keep your eyes open during sex from now on, Missy. Oh, oh, why? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, sir. So, uh, before the break, uh, just before we went to commercial there, we were talking about um, Michael Douglas and, and Beyond the Reach and... Uh, Indeed, some of his past films uh, that he's had sort of a an ulterior, almost political statement for. Right, right. <clears throat> and you know. we were we were talking about the uh, the gun control uh, issue on this particular film. Right. Well, that's what people are saying because it's apparently that you know, Mr. Douglas doesn't do much of anything without trying to make a statement. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if if we see more in the future. Unfortunately, there was a very sad story that. Uh, came out uh, a couple of months back. His son, Dylan, um, just had a bar mitzvah some months back, 14, same age as our daughters. Right. And as you know, Kirk Douglas is Jewish, but, um, you know, his mother was Protestant. He married Catherine, who was Catholic, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they've always been an interdenominational, you know, kind of family. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But apparently Dylan had... Had some Jewish friends who had bar mitzvahs, so he went to his father, Michael, and he said, I'd like to have a bar mitzvah. And, of course, Kirk was over the moon, and, you know, they did that. Mm -hmm. And someone at the bar mitzvah gave Dylan the gift of a star, David, necklace. So he wears it all the time now because he's very proud of it. Mm -hmm. And they were on vacation in Europe, and uh, Dylan was down at the pool. And some man actually came up to Dylan ranting at him. 
he shouldn't be there and you know that's the problem with this world and all kinds of stuff and Dylan went upstairs to you know the hotel room crying you know 14 about what was going on here he'd never experienced anything like that he's kind of sheltered you know yeah and uh so Michael went downstairs to confront the guy and is like, what the heck's going on here? You know, and the guy actually ranted, like probably didn't even know who Michael Douglas was. Right. And and went on that same kind of tirade. So Michael went back to L.A. and, and took out an op-ed in, in, in the paper and, uh, you know, did kind of an open letter about this sort of thing. So it was, you know, unfortunately, his son's first experience with anti-Semitism and you know, we talk a lot of stuff around here and we joke a lot, but you know, that kind of stuff is just never okay. And it's, it's, it's especially with a child. Oh, absolutely. You, you yeah. know, even if it's a teenager child, it's just not okay. It's just not cool. No. And uh, so, yeah, so don't be surprised if we see something of a project in that nature in the future, hmm. you know, because he's just known for finding. See, he'd be great for straight talk because we're all about the social causes and stuff. Yeah. So he just always seems to find something socially relevant in whatever he's doing. I wonder how he did that, you know, for Fatal Attraction and which Adrian Lyne was actually the reason I got into screenwriting. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so that's, again, one of my all-time favorite films, you know. Right. And, uh, yeah, so I wonder if there was any kind of statement with that or, you know. Some of the other films he's made, <laughs> you know, of questionable well, I, nature. I don't know, but I, I can pretty much attest that pretty much most of the films he's made, he's had some pretty sweet guns. Well, true. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. There's so many that, I mean, I don't think there's ever been a Michael Douglas film that I haven't liked. No. You know, there's just not one bad film that he's made. You know, it's a le- he's a legend. And Well, uh, you know, I got, I got to say this. My personal favorite of his has always been Black Rain. I love that one, too. But yeah. then and Andy Garcia, we, we mm-hmm. got to hang out with him mm-hmm. at uh, the premiere for Five Days of War. That was fun. Right. And, uh, yeah, that was another. That was brilliant. So cool. You know. Absolutely, yeah. He was an action star before <clears throat> action stars were cool. Come oh, yeah. think of it now. Yeah. You know, back with Jewel of the Nile even. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know. yeah. Absolutely pre-Willis. Another fantastic film, War of the Roses. Incredible film, yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, Danny DeVito also in there, which uh, I talked to Mr. Garcia a little bit about him because he's a really dear friend of the family, you know. Mm-hmm. Loved Zitzy Ann and all that stuff. And now that, well, she's passed now, but, you know, my family in L.A., they... Hang out all the time, and if I hadn't been in the music industry, dang it! Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> that's, that's oh what, well, that's what happens with that rock and roll, damn youngins. I know. Late in life, I got into what I should have been into, and uh, so here I am in the film industry, where I should be, even if it's on the periphery for now. Mm. Yes, but, uh, yes. yes. I had to go and marry a director, and now my life's not my own. Mm-hmm. Oh, you need this? Yes. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you. You are very welcome. So, yeah, you know, I love, this is what we love. You know, it's great. The films are great. We watch them. But it's a couple hours. And, you know, although, like Jeremy said, sometimes there's things that stay with you for a few weeks. You know, that tends often not to be the case. You know. Well, you know, I I can say from professionally reading scripts for a living, um, I would almost say 99.5% of them Don't. don't. Right, I know. Yes, you know, I know. Uh, but every once in a while, you know, you come across that gem that you do. You know, and uh, you know, I, I certainly could, uh, you know, relate to him when he was saying that. You know, it, it sticks with you for weeks after you're still thinking about it. And right. In all fairness, there were a couple of questions that he wasn't just quite ready to answer yet. Like, what would your dream role be? You know, because he's still so new. Right. You know, and. Um, it is fun to do these action things and, you know, have the Hollywood experience and all that stuff. But, you know, with him having so much substance, I think, you know, he's really going to find as his career progresses that, you know, it is going to be more like a Colin Firth deal with him, you know, or dare I say maybe a, a Hugh Grant in the future. Although, oh, God, I no. know. Well, Hugh could have, could have, could have. You know, but there's, oh, and I didn't even, did I get the chance to mention how much I just adore Jason Fleming? No, but Jeremy, if you're listening to this, for the love of God, do not <laughs> take any, any romantic comedies, please. Just Well, Fallen is a romantic teen thing. It's kind of like Twilight, but it's not a vampire, he's an angel. 
I know. And, and even he said it was that teen kind of I film. know, but he said the story really got him. And he didn't even realize it was one of those kind of teen novel adaptations until after he was already enamored by the story. Sure, so. sure. But, you know, uh, Jeremy is, is really young in his career. And to and already – period, right. To already have worked with uh, the great Steven Spielberg back in 2011. And Colin Firth, too. He's, you know. And Colin Firth. You know, I almost <laughs> got the sense, and, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I almost got the sense, and he even said so, that he, he really wanted to steer back towards theater. Oh, yeah. No, I know. And that's another thing. I mean, I love all that. that sort of thing like that's the thing i miss most where's Ken kenneth Branagh gone? i mean you know he adapted all the shakespeare stuff and oh so brilliant and there was some american um kind of uh, current remake sort of things like uh, leo and claire danes did romeo and juliet and they did right. it and john leguizamo was brilliant in that i've got to say and that was a great kind of remake ethan hawk is is noted for making shakespearean remakes of film um you know, so I think The Tempest and Hamlet were done and things like that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you still can't beat the originals. You know, you still can't beat the British adaptations of these kind of things. You just can't. No, no. You know, because Hollywood has that formula and it has that glitz and it has that spin. And American audiences almost never can handle a, a, a sad ending. And I, I doubt you could afford that Mercedes on a theater salary. Well, <laughs> he doesn't want it. I do. <laughs> you know. I well, want then it. don't go to theater, Kate. That's it. No, no, no. I shan't. <clears throat> I shan't. But, uh, yeah. So, you know. But, again, I, I seriously. You know, what did I say to you the first time I saw him, too? I was like, because I saw Woman in Black, too. You know, and I can't believe you sacrificed yourself at the end of that. But that's a whole nother show. Mm -hmm. You know. Cause, well, uh, to, to be totally honest, and I'm, I'm going to do it because I owe it to our listeners. I never knew who this kid was. Well, of course not. It's not your genre. It's not your, you know. I didn't know anything about him until... Uh, oh, One Night in Mexico. One Night in Mexico. Right. And, of course, I only watched that because of Robert Duvall. Well, he's a huge Western fan, my husband. So he grew up on Western. So any Western-type film, he'll watch to make sure and check it out. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and still, my number one is Unforgiven, without a question. But, right. um, you know, that's when I first saw this kid and I thought, wow. Yeah, and, and not even knowing you were impressed, right? Not even knowing. Yeah. I, I, you know, and, and just seeing that one piece of work, you know. Uh, I know. <laughs> oh, what do you mean? You didn't see War Horse, you doofus? I well, won't watch War Horse because I can't stand to even see Godzilla get shot in the end. So there you go. Yeah, well, I got less of an excuse being a director and all. But uh, no, to, to be totally honest with you, you know, I, I haven't seen a good Spielberg movie in, I don't know, 10 years or so. Uh, well, that one was really great and got rave reviews apparently. Just, you know, I can't watch it because of the subject matter. Well, there you go. You know. <clears throat> there you go. I get very but, uh, angry when animals get hurt, even pretend – you know. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm just saying all this to qualify it that you know I'm I'm not one of these these interviewers who was like all about Spielberg and all about War Horse and all about War oh, Horse. Oh yeah, and, no, no, no. Oh, Everybody you, who knows us knows we're not that. Did you see the War Horse? No, I just saw him in his supporting role with with uh, you know. Well, honestly, you know, I until I saw Woman in Black too, I hadn't seen any of the ones you had seen because I wouldn't watch War Horse, and uh, we haven't had access to a couple of the other ones as of yet, and. Um, you know, I didn't see One Night in Mexico until you turned me on to it. Right. So, you know, I I really didn't have, you know, we have teenage daughters, like we said. Well, <laughs> you and, 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 you know, to be fair, I'm going to sound like an ancient man here, but to be fair, I, I don't even know Woman in Black. I, I know Woman in Red. No, no. <laughs> woman in Black was a, well, actually, <clears throat> it starred Daniel Radcliffe, the first one. It's a British, like, uh, very atmospheric horror Oh. kind of film about a house and you know he's a, a you know kind of like a law clerk and he goes out there to assess the the workings of the mansion but then the second one actually takes place uh some years later i think during the first or second world war where mm -hmm. you know they move all the children out of london to protect them into this these abandoned mansions and of course the ghost comes back in the second ah. one so right and she's some bad bad news ghost oh really know? yeah she just totally is but you know I, I hated to see it end like that. So, right. I thought they should have, you know, 
did the happily ever after thing. Why? Because I am, you know, educated in the Hollywood formula. That's why, you know, but anybody who knows my writing too knows that I very rarely end on a happy ending. So mm -hmm. I'm more European in my, and I'm not talking, you know, British European either. I'm talking about more eclectic, like I like a lot of Scandinavian film and things like that where they're very obscure in there. Yes. Yeah. Certainly not the beret wearing smoke airs. No. What, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he had seen just about films from every country on the planet since marrying me now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And got to say, like you said, impressed with Korea. You bet. That's right. Well, listen, we're going to go for our uh, third commercial break right now. When we come back, what are we going to talk about? Oh, gosh. I don't know. You know, oh, okay. we've got <laughs> That's to, good. <laughs> you know, there's a whole bunch of things. You know, this was just, I guess, film in general and, and you know, this up and coming kind of. It's so funny. Here's what we can talk about because it is funny to me. With And we have some more, you know, interviews this week and some more films we're promoting later in the week. So you're going to want to stick around because we have a special episode coming on Wednesday. Next, yes, we're going to remind you that uh, talk, right. special straight talk come Wednesday. Right. Um, because. Because. We we're, have. We're interviewing Robert Sheehan and Gren Wells and Robert Patrick tomorrow for The Road Within. The Road Within. That's there right. Gren Wells which is, is dumb. Which is also opening this Friday at theaters everywhere. Right. But what we're going to talk about when we come back, though, is the kind of trend towards uh, either book adaptations or, you know, revisiting stories, et cetera, et cetera. The lack of originality, I think. Excellent. I'm bored already. Back okay. in two. And you're listening to Straight Talk with Kate and Crash on HTLA Radio 1, New York. What if there was a coffee that was sourced from some of the world's most renowned growing regions? Abundant with rich, fertile soil. What if this coffee was picked at the perfect moment, then packed meticulously and shipped carefully to be roasted under the watchful eye of coffee masters? What if it was expertly blended, ground, and sealed, ensuring maximum flavor and freshness, then brewed in small batches and always served fresh within 20 minutes just the way you like it? Now, what if this coffee just happened to be the coffee you already know and love? Tim Hortons. Always fresh. Always great tasting coffee. Some said the U.S. has lost its innovative power. We said America is lighting the way as the innovation nation. Singular insights, superior execution. That's the power of global connections. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Voted top global research firm, 2011, 12, and 13. Wait a sec. I found our colors. We've made the decision. Great. Let's look at your setup. We need the brush. You should check out our workshop. Push your color boundaries while staying well within your budget walls. I want to paint something else. More saving, more doing. That's the power of the Home Depot. Their premium plus interior paint. Only at the Home Depot and now only $23.46 a gallon. I've been so inspired by being in New York because everything from what people are wearing on the street to the way they're interacting with each other to drive through the West Village at night and you see a couple kissing on the street or you see someone fighting outside their apartment or you see so much humanity on a daily basis that even if you're not inspired by your own life that day, you can be inspired by someone else's life. You got that long hair, slick back, white t-shirt and I got that good girl face and a tight little skirt There's only one place to get more Taylor. 
Once again, every sip of your favorite coffee gets you closer to spectacular prizes with the return of Roll Up the Ring to Win. Like one of a thousand Napoleon Gourmet Grills. One of a hundred five thousand dollar MasterCard prepaid cards. One of millions of coffee and food prizes. Or one of 40 Toyota RAV4s. It's the coffee you love and the cup you love to roll. You've got it locked to New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1, New York. Oh. Oh, yes. Well, welcome back, gang. Yes, yes. yes. Special straight talk tonight. That's right. For this Monday, the 13th of April, 2015. Still 62 degrees tonight in Central Park, and it's partly cloudy. And tonight's episode of Straight Talk is brought to you, of course, by the fine folks at Tim Hortons in New York City. And with eight fine locations in the city to serve all your coffee and baked goods needs, Tim Hortons always fresh. And, of course, by PreSonus. Yes, the 2442 broadcast mixer we use here at Studio 2 brings you the golden tones. Check them out at presonus.com. Right. And tonight's episode, Beyond the Reach, of course, we were uh, originally, uh, back in the old days, when things were black and white, we were talking about Beyond the Reach, the new action film, the epic from Roadside Pictures, uh, Roadside Attractions, I should say, Right. and our fine, fine friends at Lionsgate Studios. Uh, and, of course, this film stars the one, the only, Michael Douglas and Jeremy Irvine, who we had uh, on the horn. Uh, Earlier just this afternoon. Yeah. Moments ago, yes. Well, yes, and moments ago. Yes, yes that too. It was moments ago. It really was. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, interestingly, you can actually watch, um, you know, when you have a chance once the film opens on Friday, definitely go see it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'd oh, be yeah. remiss in my duties if I didn't say run out and go see this film because it's amazing. And it really will be. Um, you're not going to be disappointed if you go see this movie. You can, no. If you're disappointed, you come back and you talk to me about it. But, <laughs> well, really, you know, and when do I often recommend film, you know? Uh, not so much. That's yeah, right. No. I'm pretty tough on my films and, you know, it's got to be pretty good. And, uh, you know, just from what I've seen, it's, it is reminiscent of, you know, kind of the best of the, the cat and mouse thrillers and the Western kind of deals. And I chalked that up to the fact that it was written so long ago and, um, you know, that it was originally made in 74. And mm -hmm. you can see that. Savages, by the way. You can search that out and see that online for free. Mm -hmm. So I won't tell you where because I can't do that. But No. You can do that. <laughs> you can search out Savages, parentheses, 1974, and you'll get a whole bunch of stuff and you, you can see it. Um, actually, not to be confused with the Oliver Stone film Savages, which was just a few years ago about uh, drug runners and stuff. Um, yeah, that was a brutal film, too. But well, that's right. not the one I'm talking about. But this one why. had Andy Griffiths and Sam Bottom star in it. And I was five years old. That's why you would search uh, Savages 1974. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but yeah. So, and yeah, I was correct on my dates. You know, he was born in 1909. Rob White, who'd written the book originally, which was adapted. And how funny. They credit him. They credit Beyond the Reach as one of his films in, in his uh, bio there. Sure. Well, I guess, you know, the the credits live on. So, yeah. yeah. And he did pass away in 1990. So, yes. But he was a horror writer. And surprisingly, I learned House on Haunted Hill was, you know, one of his. And mm -hmm. uh, Up Periscope, you know, Firestorm. There was just a whole bunch, you know. So, is this the trend? We were kind of going going there. You know, right. we, before the break, we yeah. said we were going to kind of go there. So many adaptations. I mean, it's you can't get away from the book adaptations anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I watched something the other day on Netflix because everything I watch is on Netflix. And I swore to God it was an original screenplay because if I haven't seen it before, then it has to be an original. <laughs> right. And right. it wasn't. It was another yet another adaptation from a book. So I was like, wow, maybe I should write books. Well, you know, plays. I, I've noticed actually in, I would say the last, I would, I would bracket the, the last six to eight years uh, more specifically. Hollywood's really uh, coming out um, pretty big time with the, 
the adaptations from novels because right. I think what happened, and, and you, you may or may not agree with me on this, but in the early 2000s, we really had a run of horrible film. Well, I don't know. Like, I guess. Was that such as? What are, what are some examples? Well, see, that's the thing. There's <laughs> nothing memorable enough to mention. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was saying, you know. Um, and I, I think the reason for that is that the original screenplays that they were working with at the time just weren't very good stories that, you know. Right. Well, there, there, you know, there's definitely a myriad of articles on the Internet that support the fact that, you know, the trend has turned to adaptation. So and and whereas, you know, true fans of the original book series, you know, are really happy that their favorite books are now coming to film. Mm -hmm. There's a whole nother section that are, you know, really terrified about that fact because, you know, their imaginative you know, interpretation of what they're reading is going to be butchered by the filmmakers. Right. So, you know, I enjoyed I enjoyed the time when, you know, Stephen King's stuff was adapted. And, you know, just a couple. You had your couple few that you knew who it was. Well, yeah, but, you know, really more what I'm talking about is, is Hollywood has always had this way of coming in and screwing everything up. And, you know, I, I pretty much got out of the business in 2000. And got back in in 2008, and, and kind of during that bracket of time, there wasn't really anything to write home about. Right. But then 2008, 2009, 2010, we start seeing all these adaptations from novels, and uh, well, of course, the quality of writing seemed to elevate with that, and all of a sudden, we're, we're, we're starting to get to the point where we're, we're having movies that, that are uh, substantive, that they've got some quality to them. Now... <clears throat> where, where I think they're kind of screwing with that now, yes, I'm talking about Hollywood again. Right. Where they're screwing with that now is is doing things like, well, let's do the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Okay, well, we did the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Oh, well, we haven't made enough money yet. Well, let's do the let's, Hobbit too. Let's do stuff that didn't happen. Right. Well, let's, they let's, mentioned that in that one article too. But let's create characters that aren't there and. You know, let's let's take this man's legacy and and just well, add to it. He won't mind, right? Well, actually, they are books. You know, they were books, but just not as as popular as the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and not as well known. And you know, and not by Tolkien. I'm not sure. I can't speak to that. You know, but uh, you know, it's almost as if, like I said, screenwriters were a dying breed. Now, if we have any original <laughs> ideas, because but then you see, then that takes me to another part of my argument, which is, of course, well, why are we doing? You know, well, we've got to do Jaws again. Well, we've got to do. Oh, please don't even talk to me about the Poltergeist we, remake. I'm we've got so to do furious. Poltergeist. We've got to do John Carpenter's <sighs> The Thing. We've you know, we've got to yeah. throw all these teeny nobodies in it, and we've got to put it out. And here's the thing: when it comes to my original, I'm by nature and by by origins a horror screenwriter. Mm -hmm. So when you mess around with my original horror films, right? I, I'm you know anything that John Carpenter has done, you touch that, you die. And they've almost remade all of them. Mm -hmm. You know, The Thing, The Fog, all that stuff that you know I grew up on that are, are sacrosanct to me, you know, and then they go and remake them all. Sure, it was okay, but they changed the stories. They changed the characters. They, they you know, modernize it to suit, you know, and it screws with the original well, story. Well, and, and don't even get me started on Star Trek. Not, oh, not and only it's coming back now. It's coming back. Well, not only that, not only that, some of the actors from some of the past successful series – are now branching off and they're doing their own thing with fans. Yeah. They're, they're doing fan productions and, and some of these things are just horrible. Yeah. I couldn't even believe some of these actors had put their names to this stuff. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess they're getting their idea to, you know, completely regurgitate all this stuff from Hollywood because they're doing it too. And they're not really doing it any better. I know. I know. And you that know. fan fiction now is huge with the advent of the internet and all these things. They're creating, for example, we have daughters, like I said, teenage daughters, and Homestuck, and Steven Universe, and all these fan-created kind of things. Like, canon is a, is a real word now. It's not just, you know, a piece of classical music anymore. It's a, you know, it means that it's original to the story, and they, God forbid, something's not canon, you know, and it, and it was in a, a fan fiction, or, you know, if there's a coupling, and they ship it, and then, you know, somebody throws something into it that's not canon or something, you know, they're all 
beside themselves. And, you know, these are all things that, you know, I have to take interest in. Did I say feign interest? I said take interest in these things because I have to support them in their endeavors, et cetera, you know. And, and some of the stories are really good. You know, the kids do have a lot of talent. You know, I originally heard the Homestuck premise. I was enthralled. It was a video game and there was a, you know, an alternate universe. And then the earth blew up and they had to go to the alternate universe and like play this game to get back home or whatever it was, you know. Yeah, the suburb, you know. So <laughs> it was pretty interesting. And, and yes, know. brought to you by the fine folks that gave you the word to bay. Well, <laughs> yeah, see, this is why I'm right. in radio now because uh, film yeah. can just. Well, they're not. They haven't made the Homestuck film yet, but they did oh, have coming. made. You know the same thing with. Um, oh gosh, you know I'm on it. I read it. I do all that stuff, and uh, you know with the Slenderman thing, you know, and uh, all of those kind of urban legends. Well, they're not really urban legends. They're they right. are, stuff but they have their own name, and I can't remember it now. Because, stuff made up by twelve year olds. Right, exactly. And then you have the real life. Two 12 year olds who tried to kill their other 12 year old classmates, sacrifice her to Slenderman, which was just a figment of somebody's imagination created for this fan fiction. All right. Kind of thing, right? And when, when does it unhealthy become entertainment or vice versa? There you go. Well, you know, I could see if they do it in such a way that it illustrates the absurdity of, you know, sacrificing a made up a child to a made up character you know but they're not doing that it's creating and perpetrating that urban legend type thing you know what I mean so and you know we've got a lot of trends for 2015 when it comes to films film and television you know diversity is huge if it's anything minority if it's anything black ish it's actually a Hollywood term folks I didn't mm -hmm. make it up oh, yeah. if it's black ish they'll buy it okay and autobiographical comedies you know, and it's it's preferable if you're a blackish autobiography too. Mm -hmm. But you know what I mean. Um, medical dramas are coming back. You know, ER has been gone a long time. Grey's Anatomy's over. You know, it's time for some good new medical drama. You know that we need it. But can we do it? Can we redo it? You know, can we recapture the magic well, the, that was is, see, those those kind of TV shows? And, and that's the thing that that really has always bothered me about television too is because you know somebody will come out with something brilliant they'll have their run of seasons seasons will be over they may or may not do something else in merchandising and go another direction uh but to bring back something and try and recapture something like that not only is it dangerous but it's sad. It's it's like Kiss still touring. Well, we can have a medical drama, but it should be something that's not just a straight hospital drama like it it was before. It should have but that, that a that was new the beauty. Twist. That was the beauty of House. Right. That was the beauty. That's of That's why House. the success of House exactly. because somebody had a brain and brought something else to the right. table. Right. It was a medical drama as straight as ER. Every week there were different cases and different you know things going on with the cast, etc. But yet it was focused on that you know infectious disease, that mm -hmm. obscure disease thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And and that series, uh, like most successful series, actually adapted and went through its own growth through its run. Sure. You know, so uh, I, I think when you have something like that, like Game of Thrones, like uh, Walking oh, Dead. Don't like, even talk to me about my Game of Thrones. Yet another adaptation, Walking Dead. Yet another adaptation from a graphic novel, no less. Mm. You know, don't even. I married House. Did anybody know that? Mm. Yeah. When I married my husband, he was House. He was. Mm. Yeah. Yet another fabulous British actor who's speaking American. And, no one and does it brilliantly, <laughs> That's too. That's right, yes. Yeah. All right, so some of the other trends, generation gaps. You know, and that's – I actually wrote a pilot, a spec pilot called Generation Gap. And this was some years ago. Mm. Well, I was living with Nanny at the time. There you go. It was Nanny, me, and my five-year-old daughter. You don't get much of a generation gap besides that. We had every generation in, in the same house. So it was originally, a, you know, kind of a, a dramedy. You know that I had written called Generation Gap yeah. would be two and a half women. Uh, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> yes, but then I got married <clears throat> and I stopped writing television and stuff like that. So it never went anywhere. But it, here it is now, 2015. If I had finished it, I could just be pitching it. But no, you know. Yeah. But there you go. See, I'm way ahead of my time, aren't I? 
You, you are. See, now Absolutely. it's 2015, and five years later, now they're doing it. You see? Mm -hmm. Look at that. Mm -hmm. You Sign saw the trend. Gun. I did. There you go. Period historical projects. You know, um, Downton Abbey. Huge, yeah. huge, huge hit. But they're always popular. I don't know if that's a trend for 2015. I don't think so, because, you know, anytime you put a new one on, I'm going to watch it. But that's just me. You know. Right. I didn't even get a chance to tell Jeremy. I'm an English rose. I'm, I'm British. I'm English by... By birth and I think he got that with the drool that was coming through the cell phone. Oh, MJ! And uh, I got to put Jeremy on notice right now. No, it's it's not for that. It's uh, if he ever accepts the role of Slenderman, yeah, no, that's that's gonna. Won't. No, he won't. He, he he's too good for that. Yeah, mm. you know it's funny. I want to think of some roles I'd love to see as he matures. I can't wait to watch his career. I'm really really excited. Mm -hmm. It's not often that we get to. Really kind of get in on the ground level of somebody's career in the way that we have now. Very true. But another one that we have and, and who I think has got some some uh, great stuff in front of him is, of course, the one, the only John Sheck. Oh, yes. Well, he's a dear friend, too. And he's working like a mad you bet. man, too. He, but, he you know, is. He's our age. So, you know, we can't really call him a young up and comer. He's a late bloomer, in my opinion. Oh, OK. You know, I don't think uh, he, he's gotten the recognition he should have. You know, but he's doing really better. He's doing parts he's, now. He's that getting a lot bigger roles. He's acting opposite the likes of Bruce Willis, etc., etc. Two, et cetera, films, et cetera. With Bruce two, two films with right. Bruce Willis. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, kind of like my guest hosts on coffee and cigarettes. If it was about twenty years ago, that'd be big. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, John is like me though. He's a horror aficionado first, mm -hmm. and if that's what he like, he prefers to do, he would do that first. Yeah. You know, that's his meat and stuff like that. So. What what was that film that we saw with him in it? He was at a cabin. They had that uh, uh, that evil book or something. What the hell was it? It wasn't the Evil Dead. He didn't. No, did, no, 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 no. Oh gosh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that was a good movie. That what, was that a movie or was that an episode of like Masters of Horror or something? Because he's done quite a bit of that. Oh, I don't know. It could have been. Yeah. Well, okay. Back to the trends. Okay. All right. Because uh, besides period historical pieces, now workplace shows are ever mm. popular and you know well now that mad men's over well, what do you mean workplace shows are now popular cheers 19 what 88 i know i know they've always been but you know on the buses for god's sake let's uh, it's time for lost in 380 yeah but you know what i mean and here's another thing that gets me angry and it's it's american adaptation of foreign tv series oh yes you know you know you know I think Jeremy could speak directly to that. Well, as well. I'm not. As, I'm not talking. <laughs> see, to me, you know, any British film, and mm -hmm. we can do that because we're the same. You know, I don't believe in the Revolutionary War, so I'm a loyalist. Okay. Just, you know, so it's fine. But when we start to try to adapt Scandinavian crime drama, you have a problem because they have unique topography and unique custom and unique things. Of that nature. And it's another reason that I'm always, always going to be indebted to Netflix. They put all of those kind of things on there. You, you browse right. the foreign TV show genre and you just sit there for months and you just never will get bored because don't ever be afraid to read your show mm -hmm. because you won't be disappointed. You know, I actually speak a lot more foreign language now because of all the foreign film that I've watched over right. the years, you know, and uh, I could get dropped pretty much anywhere and be all right for a little bit okay you know mm -hmm. but but what really bothers me is when they're really trying to adapt that kind of stuff that's so far out you know we can do australian adaptations we can do anything from like western europe you know um but when you start going you know like i said up to scandinavia or they're even starting to adapt some of the asian stuff you know you do run into things because their formula isn't the same as western formula no no and it doesn't come across well when you try to translate their pacing and their formula into american pacing and formula or just western pacing and formula mm -hmm. it doesn't work it just doesn't work and i think you lose a great great deal there mm -hmm. you know but uh, that's a trend now you know, and uh, House of Cards. That was originally a British series. Um, it was a three-part series that was one of the first I'd ever seen years and years ago. And 
gorgeous, brilliant. I, I haven't watched the Kevin Spacey one yet, but they adapted it to make it American politics. It's not the same. No. They don't have the same protocol. They don't have the same things. So, yeah. Right. And, oh, here's another trend, too, that doesn't work. Movies adapted to television. So, you know, taking a film that was really popular and now making it, you know, a show. Yeah. So, for example, Minority Report. That's a TV show now on Fox. <laughs> Uncle Buck on ABC is a TV show. That yeah. might that might be the only one that actually works. You know, because it's Not without Uncle Buck, it won't. Well, right. And he's long gone, right? And Rush Hour. You know, those great uh, Jackie Chan and, uh -huh. you know, great, great ones. They can't, I don't know how, unless they get the two of them back for the TV show. You know, I don't know how they could do it. Parenting, that's always a trend. Why is that a 2015 trend? That's a very good question. You know, that's that's clearly always going to be. All right. Well, we're going to... Uh, <clears throat> Go for our final commercial break of the evening and then come back and wrap this show up. Yeah, that works for me. Okay. All right. Yes. No, that was it. That was the last one. We'll be back yeah. in two. <laughs> You've got it locked to New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1, New York. What if there was a coffee that was sourced from some of the world's most renowned growing regions. Abundant with rich, fertile soil. What if this coffee was picked at the perfect moment, then packed meticulously and shipped carefully to be roasted under the watchful eye of coffee masters? What if it was expertly blended, ground, and sealed? ensuring maximum flavor and freshness. Then brewed in small batches and always served fresh within 20 minutes, just the way you like it. Now what if this coffee just happened to be the coffee you already know and love? Tim Hortons, always fresh, always great tasting coffee. Wait a sec. I found our colors. We've made a decision. Great. Let's look at your setup. I need the brush. You should check out our workshop. Push your color boundaries while staying well within your budget walls. I want to paint something else. More saving, more doing. That's the power of the Home Depot. Bare Premium Plus Interior Paint. Only at the Home Depot and now only $23.46 a gallon. I've been so inspired by being in New York because everything from what people are wearing on the street to the way they're interacting with each other to drive through the West Village at night and you see a couple kissing on the street or you see someone fighting outside their apartment or you see so much humanity on a daily basis that even if you're not inspired by your own life that day, you can be inspired by someone else's life. You got that long hair sleep. There's only one place to get more Taylor. Some said the U.S. has lost its innovative power. We said America is lighting the way as the innovation nation. Singular insights, superior execution. That's the power of global connections. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Voted top global research firm, 2011, 12, and 13. Once again, every sip of your favorite coffee gets you closer to spectacular prizes. With the return of Roll Up the Rim to Win. Like one of a thousand Napoleon Gourmet Grills. One of a hundred five thousand dollar MasterCard prepaid cards. One of millions of coffee and food prizes. 
or one of 40 Toyota RAV4s. It's the coffee you love and the cup you love to roll. And you're listening to Straight Talk with Kate and Crash on HTLA Radio 1, New York. Well, that's right, you are. Straight Talk with Kate and Crash on HTLA Radio 1, New York's best talk. 60 degrees tonight right now in Central Park. Windows open. Windows open. Yes. For this Monday, the 13th of April, 2015. We're rolling it here big time tonight on the show. And uh, we, we've brought you Beyond the Reach. That is the, the show title of tonight. And don't forget, we are going to have, of course, on a Wednesday night, a special edition a Wednesday night straight talk. And it's The Road Within. That's right. It's going to be a lot of fun. Another film with more stars we're bringing you on Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern. Yes. And if she's not ready, I'll just go without her. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, so you are listening to Caden Crash here on the old show tonight, and and we've been, uh, of course, prom- promoting Beyond the Reach, and we've uh, had the the interview with er- Jeremy Irvine, right? Uh, one of the two awesome stars of the film, and uh, we've just been kind of going on ever. What? Yes. Oh, right, and yes. and also it just led us into discussions about how. You know, book adaptations are so prevalent today, and and all the remaking of of film and TV now. The the lack of originality, the complete and total uh, degradation, and, and I mean, just got to yeah. mention no. before I do my outro. Just got to mention some of the ridiculous things they're thinking of of making into TV series now. Well, um, my understanding is they aren't thinking of. They've been green well, right. lit. These are they have you know yeah. real genius with Val Kimmler. Remember that. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, like I had mentioned before, anything that HBO is doing, mm-hmm. I'll watch as a pilot. They're doing Westworld, the old one with the old Brenner. Right. That was a brilliant, you know, future world and West. That was really cool, especially back in the day. Okay. Right. You know, so I'll, I'll watch that. But The Devil's Advocate. No. You can't. You can't. You know, that's Pacino and Keanu. You can't do that. Well, I- ignoring the fact that the stars from the films aren't, of course, in uh, the the television adaptations, the point is, is that the story is only so long. There's so many acts to it, and you can't do that over weekly episodic TV. Right, that's what I'm unless, saying. Unless, unless they're going to do what we, well, already are enjoying, I guess is not the correct term to use. Uh, where they're just creating their own stories now, and and they're just going to get into this this well, that's what they're going to do. Like crap. for Devil's Advocate, I'm sure there's going to be you know some weekly thing that has to be fixed or resolved, or some evil versus good kind of thing. You know, yeah. But things like Shutter Island and, and Shutter the Truman Island. Show. Well, Shutter Island they're remaking uh, called Ashcliffe, and it tells the story before. The Shutter Island film. Scorsese is actually going to direct the pilot and HBO is doing it. So that's another one that I'll watch because it's HBO, because it's a great (laughs) film and because Scorsese is directing the pilot. But, you know, it's really difficult to see how these are going to translate into episodics. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I guess you could. uh, Phantom of the Opera. Aside from the fact that he's dead, I guess you could do. Uncle Buck without John Candy, but if you did, it's just going to be like another Roseanne. Right, exactly. And, you know, the whole point of Uncle Buck was that he was Uncle Buck. And, you know, the generations that are going to watch it now, they don't know him. They're missing the whole entire, you know, history of the character in the show. Phantom of the Opera, ABC. (laughs) How are they going to make that an episodic? Uh, I, I don't Was know. she going to run away from him every episode? Well, they're probably going to do what they shouldn't do and formulate formulate it after something like Beauty and the Beast. Exactly. So, which I didn't watch then because, as much as I love Ron Perlman and Linda Hamilton, it's just yeah, no. Fairy tales translated into prime time. I don't watch them. I don't watch. You know, they have that Once Upon a Time show. They have even The Lost Girl. That's about fairies or something like that. And this is my, you know, my genre, but I just can't see it massacred like that, you know. And, you know, the fact that they remade Poltergeist, changed her name. She's not a blonde, you know. The whole shebang, it's not a little midget psychic anymore. It's an Irish priest now, you know, who's an actor, by the way, that I really love. And, um... You know, but they changed the whole entire thing. Yeah. 
And it's just, you know, it's just heartbreaking. <laughs> On the flip side of that, though, I, I have found that I really enjoy, you know, the I, uh, the Wayans brothers and and all of the the scary movies and the screams and the uh, all, all the all the all the, all the, the making fun ofs, right? The satires of right because well, it 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 just really kind of points to the ludicrousness of of, of it all. Really. Right. Well, you know, you're not a horror buff, though. No. So, in fairness, you're not horror buff. Where I'll sit there and I'll watch it and I'll really get into it. And you know, to me, it's the suspension of the disbelief and the plausibility of of whether they can pull that plausibility off enough to actually. And to me, it's just watching a whole bunch of stuff I don't believe. Right. Exactly. <laughs> he has no ability to, you know, suspend that disbelief. And no. yeah, he's a straight up <laughs> drama director. So dun dun dun. You know, but stranger truth is stranger than fiction. So there yes. you go. You know, yeah. crime. I love to write crime and, and watch crime thrillers. And you know, if you can um, stump me, then it's a good film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's a rare thing. But mm -hmm. you know, we were we watched a great film. Uh, two hours long, though. Two and a half, almost. Yeah. Oh, Robert Duvall. We love, 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 and Robert Downey Jr. Mm -hmm. Um, what was the title of it, though? That's a good question. I can't recall now. But yeah. he was uh, glad, the judge. Glad we brought it up. The judge. It was called The Judge. There you go. The Judge from 2014. Yeah. Right. And it was really good. His father is a judge. Long, long time. The mother dies. The father drives and, and accidentally hits somebody. Wah, wah, wah. And Robert Downey Jr. has to defend him against Duval's wishes. And, of course, the relationship that was in tatters growing up you know mm -hmm. they they unravel and do all that kind of stuff and vincent d'onofrio again watch him in anything mm -hmm. you know i'll watch him watching paint dry you know but, I, I think uh, he has that coming out next month on i'm Netflix, telling actually. you there's just some actors you know that uh doesn't matter what they're in you'll just watch them right yes ryan gosling and you know so yeah <laughs> that's just me though it, yeah. it is <laughs> it is just you yes <laughs> Well, I did a whole entire thing on Only God Forgives on, on Real Talk, remember? Uh, yes, actually. Yeah. That was such a good movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, we're not going to change the future of the industry this week. So no, All we no. can do is report on it. <laughs> try, try as we might. And tell you to go, absolutely, on April 17th. And uh, don't be afraid to see Beyond the Reach because it's going to be awesome. You know, the legend, Michael Douglas, it's his production company and... They've done a wonderful job. Um, you know, it's actually visually exciting to watch, not just because Jeremy <laughs> has no clothes on. I meant the location. Oh, uh, yes. Yes, I did. Yes, I yes. I, I'm, I'm well aware of your <laughs> fondness for desert. We've oh, had that conversation. I actually hate the desert. Right. But, yes. But I'll watch this one, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. Right. Oh. It's going to be good. Well, anyway. Yes. Yeah. That's all the time we have tonight. Thank you for listening to ACLA Radio 1, New York's best talk, and tonight's special edition straight talk, Beyond the Reach with Jeremy Irvine. Remember, Wednesday night, we've got another straight talk coming up, uh, The Road Within, and we're going to have uh, Robert Patrick and a whole bunch more stars and glitz right. and glamour you can shake a stick at here on ACLA, so don't miss it. That's right. And I'd 8 like p.m. Yes, 8 p.m. Eastern. 8 p.m. Eastern. Wednesday. Be there or be square. That's right. I'd like to thank HTLA Radio 1 for allowing me to bring you the issues that matter to those who to they, whom matter, they matter to most. To whom they matter most, there especially today. Right. And I definitely would like to thank Jeremy Irvine for coming by and, uh, you know, dishing about his new film. Um, huge thank you to our sponsors and our supporters. And, of course, we are nothing without you, our listeners. Last but not at all least, thank you to my producer, co-host, and from now on, shirtless husband, love truly does conquer all, Christopher Crash Jesus Taylor. Now be sure to be here next Monday, Wednesday, but next Monday, because you never know who's going to show up on Straight Talk to talk straight. Be your only one, too, and whatever you do, see you next time. Good night. Good night, everybody.
you've got it locked to New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1, New York. 